Welcome to Otter Creek Online. In just a few minutes, you're joining us virtually for our worship experience, but before we do that, we wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that some of you joining us each week online are longtime members of the Otter Creek family, and some of you are new to this online Otter Creek experience. You may even be watching from a different state today. We want you to know that our leadership team has a strong desire to know who you are. We want to know what you care about. We want to know what you're interested in spiritually. We want you to know that we want to know how we can help you grow. So here's what we want you to do very practically. If you're watching live through YouTube or Facebook, would you put something in the comment section telling us how we can reach out to you? We have a lot of ways of knowing metrics, but we don't know who you are in the online community. If you're not watching live, you're watching later in the week, would you send an email to our community life minister, james at ottercreek.org. He will get back with you. But our desire, just like with our Brentwood campus and our West End campus, our desire is to know who we're serving and how we can serve you better in the weeks to come. Thanks for joining us online and we hope to hear from you soon. leading us to the Easter resurrection of Jesus. This is a time of year we celebrate as a rhythm in our spiritual community to not only to be together, but to invite other people into this celebration. So on Good Friday at the OC West End campus at 6.30 p.m., we're inviting you to be part of that gathering. It will be contemplative in nature. And then on Sunday morning at 7 a.m. at the Brentwood campus, we have our traditional Easter sunrise service. 8 40 and 11 on sunday morning for easter we'll be at the brentwood campus and west end is at 10 a.m the reason we're reminding you of this is we want you to be aware of someone in your life who will join you they won't say yes to any other sunday invite but for easter they might say yes think about who that person might be in your life we look forward to being together during holy week as we celebrate the life of jesus Good morning, Otter Creek. Uh, we want to be mindful and aware that OCYG, we have about 100 of our high school students and volunteers are at their retreat this weekend. So if you're connected to anybody in our student ministry and you wanna encourage them, uh, our two-day retreats that we do in the fall and the spring are a huge way that we help other students connect to how God is calling them um, to serve and to be active in the world. So we wanna be prayerful and mindful. We also are working hard uh, between our two campuses and our three services to make sure that you feel connected. And that's a tricky thing in our particular cultural moment. So one of the little silly things that we do is we take time each week and we say, look for someone that you either haven't seen in a long time or someone that you don't recognize you've never met. And we're just gonna take two minutes and we're just gonna greet each other in joy. So look for someone right now and connect with them.
Good morning, welcome. So we have a common script this morning that we get to share with sisters and brothers around the globe. And the common script is centered around a particular story that is told in all the gospel accounts. We know it in its shorthand form as Palm Sunday. But the basic idea of Palm Sunday is this, that as Jesus is entering Jerusalem to encounter what we now know as Holy Week, Jesus is aware of the weight of violence and sin and death placed on his shoulders. And so as he feels the weight of the world, of the calling that God has on his life, As he looks out over the city of Jerusalem, arguably the most important city in the world today, as he looks out over Jerusalem, he feels the weight not only of what has happened to Jerusalem, but what will happen to Jerusalem in the city to come. So as Jesus enters, according to Luke, as Jesus enters into Jerusalem, he sees the gulf between the world as it is and the world as it will be. The world as it exists in division and violence and anger and animosity and the world that is to come in the new heavens and the new earth, the new Jerusalem. And it's that gap between reality and the coming new heavens and new earth that causes Jesus to mourn. Luke says he looks over the city and he weeps. I don't think he's necessarily weeping in judgment, although judgment is part of it. I think he's weeping in sadness because people don't understand the goodness of the life that he offers. And so as we gather 2,000 years, still dating our calendars by his life, the invitation this morning as we sing, as we hear scripture read to us, as we open up Mark chapter 9, is to ask God to encounter us, to speak to us in the lives that we're living. And the best way that we do that is in our response to God through song. Let's stand together and sing this hymn.
Give God our praise this morning for his goodness. We are grateful. Lift your voice. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh, oh my soul. Worship. like never before oh my soul I'll worship your holy name the sun comes up it's a new day dawning it's time to sing your song again whatever Let's remain standing for the reading 
scripture this morning. When Jesus had come near Bethpage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples saying, go into the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. Now, as he was approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees and the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. It's not just a story. It's a living, breathing, walking testimony For God so good, he'll leave his own in glory For the world he loved, for the world that he so loved It's not just a story I believe in the life of Jesus I believe that he conquered death I believe in the resurrection. I believe He's coming back again. I believe that the Spirit's with us. I believe that He gives us power. I believe that He is the Son of God. I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. I believe in the life of Jesus. I believe it. I believe it. I believe. Can't deny If I said I'd got here on my own I'd be lying Cause my eyes have seen the goodness of the Father With the ones he loved With the ones that he so loved Oh, I can't deny it I believe in the life of Jesus I that he conquered death. I believe in the resurrection. I believe that he's coming back again. I believe that the Spirit's with us. I believe that he gives us power. I believe that he is the Son of God. I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. I believe in the life of Jesus. I believe
can we celebrate what Jesus has done for us this morning? Amen. Y'all have a seat, please. Good morning. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. As we come to the table this morning, I want to take a minute to notice what heavy burdens we may be carrying. Notice your thoughts, feelings, how your body feels. What are the things weighing down your soul? Anxiety, competition, shame, comparison, fear. The unending need to get it right or be right or however else perfectionism and self-righteousness may manifest wearing a mask that looks holy, but is really about control. Maybe we minimize or dismiss our burdens because others have heavier burdens. Thankfully, God doesn't need to triage our soul care because God is infinitely capable of being with us, all of us, at all times. Where do you need God to give you rest this morning? Jesus always hosted tables that invited people exactly as they were. Greedy and disloyal tax collectors, betrayers, deniers, Pharisees, generic sinners, complicated people of all sorts. Jesus gives us an image in the story of the prodigal son that even ungrateful sons that behave in the worst imaginable ways are not only allowed at the table, but welcomed and celebrated. In fact, the only person not at the table was the older brother who kept the rules and was faithful, but didn't like who else got to be at the table. So he removed himself from the table. All are welcome at the table of God to acknowledge the hard things we carry, the heavy masks that we wear is very vulnerable. But we serve a kind God who is tender with our weaknesses. Come to me, he says, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens and I will give you rest. Let's pray. God, we are grateful I pray for each one of us that we will know with certainty deep within our spirits the truest thing about us, that we are your beloved children. Lord, open our minds and hearts to your love and give us some experience of how wide and deep and overwhelmingly abundant that love is. Lord, help us to let go of our striving and rest in your transforming love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Stand and sing this. It's all creation groaning. It is. It's a new creation coming. It is. It's the glory of the Lord to be the light within the midst. It is. It's it good that we remind ourselves of? About five years ago, we began developing a plan for Aging Together, a ministry for the older members at Otter Creek. And we were surprised to learn that more than 30% of the Otter Creek adult members are 60 years old or older. We first began with the Sunday school class, and then COVID came, and we had to put our plans on hold. But during that time, we continued to talk and determined that we not only wanted a class, but some social activities, but we also wanted a social worker who could help our older members as they made plans for their future. 
and also our younger members who need help with their aging parents or family. Someone who could guide us down the winding road of Medicare, Medicaid, long-term care, senior housing, and so on. In 2022, we hired Stephanie Nitty, a licensed certified social worker, to work on an as-needed basis. Also, as we dreamed about how we wanted this ministry to serve this age group, we couldn't help but notice the needs related to household maintenance and general upkeep, those jobs that many couldn't do and maybe didn't even know who to call. That's when Eric Roper and Buddy Ladd, two fairly new Otter Creek members, showed up and said, we have a not-for-profit organization called Books of John, and we would like to work with your Aging Together ministry to find the people who need help. So watch this video as we share a bit about how Otter Creek plans to meet the needs of our widows, widowers, aging population, and sing single mothers here at Otter Creek. I'm Eric Roper. This is Buddy Ladd. We have a local nonprofit. It's called Books of John, where we specialize in taking care of widows, widowers, and senior care. Um, we go into somebody's house and takes care of the basic needs and necessities that they might have on a daily basis to relieve that burden and stress and spread the ministry of, of love and grace. Some of our uh, people that we serve, they don't have any kind of support group. And so the only meaningful interaction they may have is us coming to them and saying, hey, we're here to clean out your gutters, whatever it may be. Just the nicest guys. And I think I cried through the whole time that they were here. I was widowed nine months ago. Kind of the last thing I told my husband before he died was please don't let anything fall apart because he was my fix it man and could do anything. I just think it's such a ministry because I don't know who to call for certain things. And you know, I try to do YouTube and fix as much as I can. He came over and wrote down everything. He said, okay, what's next? And I said, no, that's plenty if you could just fix that. And I, he said, no, I know you've got other things. Because we keep everything at like a $200 or below limit, we make sure that we're able to spend the time that we need to at location, actually ministering to the people that we serve. And then also we're able to get more volunteers in to help us with those tasks. It's definitely a service of getting these houses in good shape, safe, make sure that our, our people have what they need, no matter if it's a snowstorm or whatever it may be, um, they know that they have that guy they can call to come out and help. And it just means the world to them mm -hmm. and to us. All right, I think I can say that was more painful the second time for me watching it. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to give this, uh, give this a go again. Uh, Books of John is, is really based on you know, two things. We've gotta have people to go serve and we've gotta have volunteers. Our volunteers don't have to be a, create, a, a craft tradesman or, or somebody skilled. If you've got that tinge in your heart that you just wanna do something bigger than yourself, then we've got a place for you. Uh, we've got our QR codes up here. You can learn more about us there, or after this, we'll be in the gathering room uh, where you can meet us there and talk about what you want to do. Thank you. Um, I'm David Schaub, and honored to serve as one of the shepherds here at Otter Creek, and just want to thank these humble servants, Paulette and Buddy and Eric and a couple of others, Paul Jankowski and Randy Spires, who have helped get this initiative going. So um, at this time, we'd like to offer a prayer both for this ministry and also for the opportunities to support other ministries here at Otter Creek. So will you join me? <clears throat> our Father and our God, we come before you humbly as we enter this Holy Week of Easter, and we are thankful that you have blessed us so richly, and we ask your blessings on those who need help here, that we can find those people and that we can help them. And Father, we ask that you bless our congregation, our fellowship, as we continue to strive for good works in your service. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen.
We are journeying through the Gospels and looking at different men and women who have given us a case study for how we think about our own lives. And one of the things that I've been convicted of over the last five years is the way that Jesus teaches us about what it means to be friends. Unlike American culture, which endorses convenience friendship, well, I'll be friends with you as long as it's easy. Jesus demonstrates the complete opposite. Jesus seeks out friends who are messy, who are needy, who don't quite get it, who are good one day and then bad three days in a row. He doesn't choose his friendships based on convenience, but rather he chooses friendships based on who he believes God has called him to love. Neither does Jesus subscribe to the American idea that friendship should be transactional. This happens in churches, it happens in schools, it happens in organizations, but inherently we will, without even acknowledging it, seek out friendships with people who we think can offer us something. You scratch my back, I scratch yours. This friendship will benefit both of us. And Jesus seeks out friendships with people who on the surface seem to offer him nothing in return. But the love of God that had been poured out in his own life compelled him to seek out friendships with people who were inconvenient, who were messy, and who had very little to offer him. This is why Jesus says, for instance, in the Gospel of John, no greater love has a man than this, as he's on his way to the cross, that he would lay his life down for his friends. This is not about it being easy, and it is not about what this person has to offer you. And sometimes in our church communities or our schools or our jobs, as we size people up, instead of asking, how has God called me to love and to serve this person? In our selfishness, we ask, what does this person have to offer me? And this is the invitation of Jesus on many levels and many fronts is to, re to reconsider how we engage people. Now, it's so interesting when you look at the life of Jesus comprehensively through the four Gospels, you notice he has a wide array of friend groups. His friends are not all the same. His friends are not friends with each other. He has one of the most diverse friend groups you will ever find. And I, I've been convicted of this in my own life. Like if I'm only friends with people like me, it might be okay, but it's not Christian. If you want to be friends with people the way Jesus is friends with people, he intentionally sought out a diverse array of people that he would spend his life and his time with. Whether it's the 12 apostles who had some inherent tensions of their politics and how they understood violence within their own group, they understood Israel and Rome in different ways. Just think of the sons of thunder versus Matthew, the tax collector. They don't get any more different than that. Or if you think about the women listed in Luke chapter 8, some accomplished, wealthy, educated women who are using their influence and power to expand the ministry of Jesus. Mary and Martha, Mary Magdalene. Jesus has all these different ways of connecting with people, but none more so than his inner circle. And what I would encourage you to think about as we're going to narrate a particular story that Jesus in experiences with his three closest friends, is do you have a home team? Like, do you have a core group of people in your life that you know whether you're crushing it or you're struggling, whether you're successful or you're failing, that there are a committed group of people in your life who do not change as external conditions change, but they are with you through all of it. Do you have a home team? And what I've noticed with men in particular is that when men begin to isolate themselves, when men begin to distance themselves from friends, that's when things can go really wrong. Now, Jesus' inner circle is clearly Peter, James, and John. Peter, who some describe as the apostle with the foot-shaped mouth, who has a temper that can be triggered in any moment, who talks a big talk, right? But when things get hard, he's the first one to leave. James and John, these brothers, John who will go on to do all these amazing things, but James and John who are brothers who will say in the end of chapter 9 when they don't like a group of Samaritans and a Samaritan region because they don't seem to be open to what Jesus is doing through the ministry of miracles, their solution is 
not to pray for Samaritans or to study the Bible with Samaritans. They say, hey, Jesus, is this when we should call down fire? Should we nuke the whole Samaritan region? And Jesus is like, you're my friends, but you drive me crazy. Have you listened to anything I've said about the love of God and the peaceable kingdom? So in the midst of this tension that Jesus is experiencing with his three closest friends who do not understand who he is, Mark describes this amazing scene in the ninth chapter of Mark. It's no secret that Jesus relied on spiritual disciplines. All throughout the Gospels, it says, Jesus, as was his custom, withdrew to solitary and lonely places. And so you get this vision of Jesus that when he's frustrated, when he's been beaten down by life, he knows himself well enough to say, I have to get away. I have to connect with God. I have to know who I am in my spirit because these people are crazy and they don't get it. And if I don't steward my own soul, I will have nothing to give these people. And so often Jesus will take people with him in these encounters. And in Mark chapter 9, when Jesus is exceedingly frustrated with Peter, he takes Peter, James, and John, and they go up on a mountain. Scholars argue about which mountain. That's not as significant as what happens. Because as they are having this experience of contemplation, so they can then discern how has God called me to act. It's only that you can serve by being prayerful. In the midst of that, they are going to experience their own theophany. We looked at Paul's theophany last week when he's on the 150 mile track, right? From Jerusalem to Damascus. And Jesus interrupts Paul's life with a theophany, like a burning bush or the parting of the Red Sea or the dreams of Jacob. Jews have believed for centuries in theophanies. And as Jesus is taking his three closest friends up on this mountain to pray, because he's probably done with them. God messes with all of them. God places Elijah and Moses in their midst. Peter, who just can't stand the awkwardness of it, says, hey, uh, Jesus, uh, should, we, should we build three tents, one for you, one for Elijah, one for Moses? And James and John are like, what are we supposed to do? Just stay up all night? And in the midst of that awkwardness, Jesus is talking with Elijah and Moses. Peter and James and John are like, I don't know what to do. Mark says, Jesus was filled with radiance, a radiance that was so overwhelming. If you wanted to extend or increase the radiance, no human on planet earth could do it. I have no idea what that means. I'm just telling you what Mark is saying. God interrupts this theophany by speaking The same words over Jesus that God speaks earlier in Jesus' baptism. This is my son, whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. Right after God is done speaking, Elijah and Moses disappear. Jesus' three best friends eventually go back down the mountain. They're arguing about Elijah, what resurrection means. Has Elijah come? Is it a metaphor? Is it John the Baptist? We don't know exactly. And then you're left with this feeling of what just happened because even by gospel standards, it's an odd story. Did you know that the Bible has been translated into English in over 900 languages? 900 versions of the English language, I should say. 736 languages describing the Bible. And in all of those English translations, in all of those different languages of the world, versions of the story, it doesn't matter how accurate, how created, how led by the Holy Spirit those translations are, you still have stories that just make it challenging to understand as a 21st century American, how do I relate to Jesus on a mountain with Elijah and Moses and his three closest friends? But we keep trying in English 900 times in all the languages of the world, 736 times. One of the most recent versions of this is something called the Gen Z Bible. This is not a translation, let's be very clear. This is how the Gen Z Bible translates Mark chapter 9. 
I got this book and it is Stories from the Bible is told by Gen Z and it has me rolling. This is the book. I'm going to read you a story out of it. Transfiguration. So this is the story of Jesus and the transfiguration. Jesus took three of his besties up a mountain and he dropped the hardest reality at it and thought they wouldn't notice for he had a supernatural glow up and his face and clothes were divinely extra. When they saw this, it altered their brain chemistry. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah were vibing with Jesus. So Peter tried to match their energy and said, Hey, yo, y'all trying to chill or not? Nah? Just then, a bright cloud entered the chat and a voice came from it and said, This is my son. He's him. Let him cook. The three bros were low-key terrified and Jesus yeeted his, glorif his glorified era. And Moses and Elijah skirted back to heaven. And as they gritted down the mountain, Jesus told them, gatekeep all these facts you have witnessed until the CEO of life glows back up. The three bros wondered what glowing back up meant and said, maybe it's the friends we made along the way for they still didn't understand the assignment. Anyway, this is the book. If you want to enjoy a fresh view on some of these Bible stories, it's hilarious. <laughs> How many of you remember when Eugene Peterson's translation of the Bible in the mid to late 90s started to come out? And the church that I grew up in was so suspicious of Eugene Peterson, right? Man, if you could, if you could go back and teleport that translation into 1995 Churches of Christ, that is a sociological experiment I would sign up for. But in all of those translations, all of those summaries, interpretations, you kind of hear the human spirit yearning to make sense of these stories in language that is accessible to us. Now we can describe the pitfalls of this endeavor, which have been true since the very beginning of the translation process. And yet still translated into 900 different ways in the English language, 736 different languages, you still have to deal with this story of God interrupting ordinary time on a mountain with a theophany. One of the things that I love the most about our Vision 2029 is that Vision 2029, if you're new to Otter Creek, is our guide or compass to our 100th birthday. So Otter Creek right now exists in two campuses, one church, two campuses, we have three different Sunday morning worship services. We have a number of ministries, 29 different recovery groups using our two campus. But in the midst of all this busyness and kingdom activity, Vision 2029 is an anchor point, a compass to say, over the next several years, here's how we're going to get to our 100th birthday. It doesn't mean we limit the work of God. It just means after two years of prayerful consideration, this is where we think God is leading us. And at the beginning of that document, I love that our leaders have gone out of their way to describe how we think about the Bible because a lot of people are talking about how we think about the Bible. What do we mean when we talk about the Bible? And the three words that we use are perfect for this story this morning. The Bible is inspired, it's trustworthy, it's authoritative. It's inspired, meaning literally it's God-breathed, that God's spirit is involved with those who wrote these stories, who recorded these stories, but that God is also intimately connected to those who would read these stories. So not just the authors of scripture, but those who then would come and read these stories 2,000 years later. It's trustworthy, meaning it has stood the test of time. It's authoritative, and I'm not sure if some of us believe this, but it's authoritative in the sense that the Bible knows you better than you know you. What I'm saying, church, is the Bible is smarter than we are. Is it easy to understand? Is every particular point in the narrative clear? No. But one of the reasons the Bible has stood the test of time is it is part of this living wisdom tradition, what helps us to understand our lives. And my experience is that when we live with these stories in the New Testament, we begin to ask really good questions. So just take Mark 9, for instance. The way that we honor the inspiration of scriptures is we ask good questions. Why does Jesus take his three closest friends on a mountain? 
there's a lot of evidence, but I still can't prove it. But this is what I think. Jesus is going to leave them. And he knows, like a commanding officer in the army, if he doesn't give his disciples the tools that they need to navigate the complexity of life, they will quit. This is what a good coach does in any sport. This is what a teacher does in any artistic discipline of piano or theater. Once the game starts, once the play starts, the coach has almost no influence. Can I get a witness? Your brackets bear witness to this this weekend. But a good coach, like a military officer knows, if I give my soldiers the disciplines they need to navigate the complexities of life, even when I'm gone, they will not only be able to survive, they will flourish. Jesus has observed Peter and James and John. I think the reason he's closest to them is he knows they need him the most. Those three are a hot mess. Peter has so much potential. If you were using NFL draft language, the lowest floor, the highest ceiling. But he's a mess. He messes it up more than the other 11 combined. And so what does he do? He does the opposite of what I would do with messy people. I would distance myself. Jesus brings them even closer. So when he's inviting them into his life of being disciplined in prayer, this relationship of contemplation and action, what he's doing for James and Peter and John is he's saying, I'm not going to be here. And if you don't learn how to take care of yourself, you will quit. It's going to get hard. If you think the last three years have been hard, you have no idea what's coming after I've been crucified. That's why he took him on the mountain, to reinforce how important the disciplines are. But what was he trying to teach them on the mountain? How much did he know of what God was going to do. These are certain mysteries in the text that the Bible does not answer. But if I were going to guess, the second layer of this is that spiritual disciplines and this theophany remind us of this sacred truth in the spiritual life, which could be described in this way. Spiritual disciplines, be it prayer, fasting, reading the Bible, serving the poor, giving generously, all the, there are a thousand, but the main ones are meant to remind us that we do not view heaven through earth's point of view, but we view earth through the lens of heaven. The problem for Peter and James and John is they could only think in their physical limitations. And so by interrupting the world as they knew it, how many times had they gone on the mountain to pray and nothing happened? How many times have you shown up on a Sunday thinking, man, I need something to happen. Oh, I know this song. Oh, Josh has preached this text before. I can finish the sentence before he, I got my Josh bingo card right here. How many times have you gone on a retreat? or got up to pray in the morning and you're like, I don't even know why I do this anymore. The gospels say, as was Jesus's custom, he often withdrew to lonely, solitary places. Because Jesus knew that when you keep showing up and you keep doing the work, sometimes God messes with you. And James and Peter and John were so frustrated with Jesus it wasn't going how they wanted it to go. And Jesus is like a father saying, just, just close your mouth for a second, children. Let's go to the mountain and let's pray and let's trust that God will give us the words that we need. And they end up having this all-time experience. Why does Mark place this story right in the heart of the worst moment that Peter and Jesus had experienced in their friendship. There are these 
patterns in the New Testament, which is why we have to stick with it even when we don't understand it. But there are these patterns in the New Testament that are meant to hook you, the reader, to draw you in, to help you to understand what Jesus is doing. One of those patterns goes like this. In Mark chapter 8, Jesus said, I'm going to die. I'm a loser. You guys think I'm the best thing in the world? You will not think, you will not think that when I'm naked, hanging on a tree, and they're like, you're not going to do that. You're Superman. You're our guy. You can't lose. And Jesus says, oh, I'm going to lose, and you're going to lose too. And he clarifies. And then in chapter 9, he says the same thing. And Peter objects publicly. And Jesus takes him aside, according to Mark, and he rebukes him, which is the strongest Greek word we have that could be translated chastisement. And then Jesus says something that will break Peter's heart. He says, Peter, you think you're my best friend. Get behind me, Satan. You do not understand the nature of the kingdom of God. That's the context for what led Jesus to take his three closest friends on the mountain. If you read Mark 9, 1 carefully, one could insinuate that they haven't spoken to each other because the beef is so real. The tension is so strong between these two friends that they haven't spoken to each other for six days. Maybe Peter can't even look him in the eye. I thought you were different. You're just like all these other messiahs who pretended to be something they weren't. And God speaks on the mountain. This is my son. He's him. Let him cook. Which is to say, Peter, shut your mouth. You are not as smart as you think you are. Jesus is telling you the truth. Jesus was so frustrated with Peter. He's like, now I got to get my dad involved. Now what are you going to do, Peter? It's so interesting when you keep reading the New Testament because you see this maturation in the characters of the Gospels and then what they write later. Like when you look at the early writings of Paul, man, he's got an edge to him. I'm not sure many of us would want to hang out with Paul if I'm being honest. Peter softens as he gets older, which should be the goal of every Christian. As I get older, I want to be more loving, more kind, not more judgmental and more cynical. So Peter, who will go on to not only be rebuked by Jesus, but he will betray Jesus even when he says, everyone else will betray you, but not me. As Jesus stayed steadfast in his friendship with Peter, Peter softened because he needed love up close. And listen to how Peter describes his relationship with Jesus towards the end of his life in 2 Peter. This is a different human. Peter says, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we have been eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory saying, this is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. This is a man who has been humbled by his encounters with Jesus. In Mark 14, when Jesus is questioning his own calling, he takes his disciples to the Mount of Olives, which is on the east side of Jerusalem. If you go to the Mount of Olives today in Jerusalem, it's one of the most sacred parts of the entire city. There are trees that are maybe 1,000, 1,500 years old, these majestic trees. If you go there early in the morning at late at night, you can't decide if it's sacred or if it's haunted. It just has this character to it. And Mark says that when Jesus is wrestling with his own calling, am I really going to be crucified and shamed, humiliated for the sake of the kingdom of God? He takes his disciples to pray just like he had done his whole ministry. And then he looks at his 12 and he says, all right, Peter, James, John, come with me. And they withdraw to the group. And then he tells those three in Mark 14, pray 
because we are about to enter the most difficult part of the human experience, suffering and death. And while Jesus is off, according to Mark, for one hour, big Peter can't even stay awake. And Jesus comes back to him and says, you're supposed to be a spiritual giant. You literally can't even stay awake. What are, who are you? And then in his crucifixion and his death and his public humiliation, Peter, James, John, the other nine apostles, they all disappear. And in Jesus' resurrection through the messenger in Mark 15, just six chapters after this, after this encounter on the mountain, Jesus sends this word back to the disciples. According to Mark, the message is this. Go tell the disciples and Peter that I'm going ahead of you. You can imagine the ink that has been spilled over why does he designate Peter separate from the apostles, from the disciples. And the simplest reading in Mark's narrative is this. He is saying to Peter in that moment, I need to know if you're in or if you're out. I told you you were going to betray me three times. You did. And now you need to decide, Peter. You had an encounter with God on the mountain, and God told you, I am who I said I was. Peter, it's time for you to decide. Are you in or are you out? Because sometimes that's what good friends do. They tell us exactly what we need to hear, not what we want to hear. And Jesus gives us an amazing legacy. As we build a church of kingdom friendships, not convenient relationships, not transactional relationships of, well, this person can help me in this endeavor, so I'll help. None of that is the kingdom of God. But in the kingdom of God, when we walk with each other, when we commit to being with each other through hell or high water, that's when we honor the life and the legacy of Jesus. But he goes first. And he says, watch how I love James and John and Peter, and now you guys go love each other the way I have loved you. And so we pray, Father and Son and Holy Spirit, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you stand with us? As we sing this last hymn, we will have shepherds available to pray with you in the back. If you're new to Otter Creek, if you go out these back doors and just turn to your right, there's a prayer room with shepherds who will be available. Let's sing this last song with everything that we have. It's not just a story It's a living, breathing, walking testimony Of God so good he leave his home in glory The world he loved, the world that he so loved It's not just a story Jesus, I believe that he conquered death. I believe in the resurrection. I believe that he's coming back again. I believe that the Spirit's with us. I believe that he gives us power. I believe that he is the Son of God. I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. I believe in the life of Jesus. Jesus, I believe it, I believe it, I believe it. We cry, holy, holy, let the earth rejoice. He is worthy of our praise. We cry, holy, holy, let the earth rejoice. Jesus. 
As you leave here today, as you leave the sanctuary, um, they'll be handing out uh, palm leaves or palm fronds. And in the book of John, the people not only left their cloaks on the ground as Jesus came through the city, but they also waved palm branches and they laid branches down on the ground to honor him and to worship him. Jesus knowing full and well that a few days later, that would be the same crowd who would be crucifying him and yelling, crucify him, crucify him. And so we remember Jesus in this way, in this tangible way of a God who put on flesh to come and live among us, dwell with us, breathe, and to suffer along with us. So take this frond with you, uh, put it on your nightstand, tape it to your mirror, you can fold it, put it in your Bible to mark the passage so that we can remember this time that we've had together today. Have an amazing week and we will see you next weekend, Easter weekend.